Hello everyone and welcome to another Endgame Principles video. I'm really looking forward to this video because the topic today is a very important one. We will be talking about pawn breakthroughs and pawn breakthroughs are an integral part of your overall endgame arsenal because they apply, uh, of course, not only to pawn endgames, but uh, as with many concepts, discussing them through the prism of pawn endgames is, in my opinion, the best and most effective way to, to master them. I'm especially excited and a little bit nervous because I kind of have a gripe about how pawn endgames are taught in, in chess literature, and so I really wanted to get this video right, and so I took a pretty long time preparing it. I'm excited to share my findings with you. Now, as is our tradition, let's start with a definition. And this part is actually more important than you might realize, so don't zone out, uh, because the definition actually includes a, a little clause that I haven't seen in too many other definitions. The way that I choose to define pawn breakthroughs is a temporary or permanent sacrifice that creates a passed pawn or favorably alters the pawn structure. So the important bits there are the fact that it's a sacrifice, and that it does one of two things. Most breakthroughs are aimed at creating a passed pawn, not necessarily in one move, as we'll discuss, but that's the ultimate aim. But not all pawn breakthroughs, when done properly, create passed pawns. And there's an entire category of pawn breakthroughs, which we will discuss, that aim to restructure uh, the pawn formation in a way that benefits your side, that benefits your king. So with the definition out of the way, let's get to the meat. And let me switch scenes. And here we go. Now, the way that I've chosen to structure this video is as follows. We are going to go through 10 of the most common types of pawn breakthroughs in abstraction, as you'll see. And I haven't done any scientific research or mathematical calculations. This just comes from my experience. I've chosen the 10 that I've seen most commonly in chess practice. So we're going to discuss what those are all about. And then we are going to move on to the practicum. We are going to take a look at six or seven examples that feature these pawn breakthroughs. And you will get a chance to practice uh, identifying uh, these pawn structures and putting these breakthroughs into practice. Obviously, the examples are going to be a little bit more involved and, and convoluted uh, because I, I always try to give you sort of the practical, most practical application. And uh, the purpose of this video, the main purpose of this video, is to help you master typical uh, breakthrough scenarios, structures and substructures that allow breakthroughs to happen, uh, but also more generally uh, to help develop your sense of when a pawn breakthrough might happen, right? So I'm not pretending that these 10 typical scenarios encapsulate all of the pawn breakthroughs that will happen in your games, right? Hopefully, it'll encapsulate most of them, but hopefully, I will also give you the machinery necessary to quickly and effectively identify opportunities to uh, create pass bonds via breakthroughs. And the most fun part of this video was the naming process. I had to name all of these breakthroughs, these typical breakthroughs, to give you, uh, hopefully, a better memory marker. I don't think I'm going to be applying for any creative jobs anytime soon, so don't judge too harshly. Uh, but that part was really, really fun. So let's jump in. And let's discuss the 10 most common types of pawn breakthroughs. Okay, so before we start with the first position that's in front of you, which is the sort of most typical type of pawn breakthrough, I called it easy, um, spelled in the Twitch way, because it's sort of the most obvious, the most basic type of pawn breakthrough, which is, of course, as you can guess, the move G5, which clears the pawn out of F6. That's the sacrifice, and that's the pass pawn. The, pa the pawn uh, reaches promotion unobstructed. And the way that you can think about this breakthrough is you're doing exactly the same thing as if you would have had a pawn not on f5, but on f4, right? It, it, the concept is exactly the same. You're clearing the way for this pawn to go forward. This is the easy breakthrough, the most typical type of breakthrough. But we're quickly going to reach uh, the breakthrough, which I think is most commonly taught when people talk about pawn breakthroughs. And generally, they just show that breakthrough and then stop there, except that type of breakthrough is, in my opinion, one of the the less common. We'll get to it in a couple of moments. But first, let's continue with the bathtub formation. This is a type of pawn structure which arises very frequently out of a particular range of openings, in particular the Karo Khan. Uh, those of you who play the Karo Khan with either side, you might recognize uh, this formation from a lot of your games, and it kind of looks like a bathtub. I didn't invent that, full disclosure. This one uh, is pretty well known. And uh, once again, I'm showing these breakthroughs in abstraction. So these positions in particular, uh, I just put the kings on a1 and a8 so I could make moves. Uh, they're not necessarily all winning for white, 
uh, but I'm just trying to show the breakthrough in action. So the deceptive thing about the Bata formation and about a lot of these breakthroughs is that they, they stem out of relatively symmetrical pawn structures. And you might think, well, because the pawn structure is totally symmetrical, uh, you cannot create a pass pawn. And that is a complete illusion. That's just not how chess works. And you shouldn't think about it that way. And if you look at this position very carefully, you will see that there is not one, but actually two different ways that white can forcibly create a pass pawn. The first and uh, the most typical is to play the move f5. Now, if black trades, then it's all easy. You don't need a, a breakthrough. You just play e6 and you create a passer. But the question is, what do you do if white black doesn't trade, if black just waits? And this is the important bit. You shove this pawn all the way through to f6. Now, black most of the time has to trade because if black pushes, then you either take on passant or you take simply take g6. And the f pawn, of course, uh, inevitably promotes. So once black takes on f6, hopefully you see where this is going. You take back, and now you've set the stage for the actual breakthrough. Now the easy breakthrough with g5, forcing the pawn out of h6, and uh, you create a corner passer. And a lot of these breakthroughs actually result in you having a corner pass pawn, which if you watched the previous video, you know, is a huge asset. Outside passers are among the most dangerous. So this is the bathtub formation. Next, we have the pawn square, and this is one of my favorites. This is one that is most commonly blundered by chess players of all levels, as we'll see. And the pawn square arises in the following scenario. So let's assume that it's black to play in this position. And black is thinking and says, well, I want to create a pass pawn on my own. So what I'm going to do is play the move g6. And then I'm either going to take h5 and create a passed f pawn, or after the trade, I'm going to go h5. Looks totally watertight, right? Wrongo. The pawn square is created when you play g5. This is the square, and this is a deadly idea because it forces the h6 pawn off of the board or off of the h file and inevitably creates a passed pawn. The funny thing is that it allows black to create a passed pawn as well, but most of the time your passed pawn is going to be so much further advanced than black's. In fact, in this concrete position, white actually wins with the move g5. So the pawn square kind of comes out of nowhere. It's incredibly important to identify opportunities to create a pass pawn this way, and it can allow you to swindle a lot of lost positions, as we'll see in the practice part. Next, we have what I call the head chopper. Uh, I named it this way because, well, you essentially chop the head off of, I'm sorry, this is very vulgar, you chop the head off of Black's structure, but hey, you'll remember it better. And then you create a pass pawn. And again, there are two ways to do it, uh, symmetrical. But uh, the, the basic idea is that you go f5 or you can go h5, but this is the way to create an outside passer. If black ignores, then you push. If black takes, then uh, you play h5 and then you play g6 and you create a passed pawn or you go h5. You do the same thing on the other side of, uh, of the board. So notice that in this case, it's not the breakthrough itself that creates the passed pawn. So we can amend our definition to say that a, a breakthrough is a sacrifice that creates or aids in the creation of a passed pawn, right? You sacrifice in order to create this majority, and then you use this majority uh, to, uh, to, to create a passed pawn. So this is the famous head chopper. Next, we have another one of my favorites. I called it, I couldn't decide a name for this one for the longest time. I called it East Coast, Best Coast, because essentially you promote on the right side of the board. Very uh, sophisticated, I know. And it occurs very specifically, what I want you to see here is Black's pawn structure in this position. And of course, all these breakthroughs can be uh, sort of put, uh, done with colors reversed. It's just that I, I'm doing this uh, for convenience sake, right? Uh, we're examining them all from White's point of view. Uh, so the point here is that you're actually going to still create a passed H pawn, even though it doesn't look like you can create a passed pawn at all. Black's pawns are kind of deep freezing white's pawns, to use a, a term from earlier in the video. But uh, there is a simple breakthrough here, and then there's a more complicated one. The simple breakthrough and the less frequent one is the move H5. You're threatening H6, you're forcing black to take, and then you go F5, E6. But this doesn't create an outside passer, and frequently black's king, uh, or white's king if you're breaking through with black, can, can stop one of these pass pawns. So the more conventional way of doing this is to play f5. Again, if black doesn't do anything, you kind of know the drill. You go e6, or you can go f6 first and then e6. And if black takes, uh, again, you have another breakthrough that you can make. You can play g6 and create a passed e pawn this way. But the standard application here is to play h5 and then h6 and create a passed h pawn. This structure actually occurs very, very frequently, and opportunities for this kind of breakthrough are often missed even by very strong players, as we will see. So East Coast, Best Coast. Okay, we already did this one. That's the uh, typical breakthrough. Next, we have the Undoubler. 
And uh, the undoubler is actually not a breakthrough that's done in order to create a pass pawn. And this is the important bit because I just feel like these types of breakthroughs are not often talked about and they're often not fully understood by players. So listen carefully. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll want to master this. Okay, so essentially we have a position like this. And as you can understand from the title of the, from the name of this breakthrough, uh, the way it's going to be done is you're going to play f6 and you're going to sacrifice the f pawn and undouble your pawn. Yeah, your F pawn. So black essentially most of the time has to take. And then you're going to get this type of pawn structure. And you might ask, well, why the heck would we want to change the structure in this way? Well, imagine for a second that our kings were not on A1 and A8. Let's bring the kings a little bit closer together, right? Let's create a position like, uh, I don't know, like this, right? What it, It's hard to make progress right now because if you try to shoulder the black king and try to squeeze it to the right side of the board, you're actually going to lose the game, right? You're going to lose all of your pawns. But what you can do is play f6 in order to use black's pawn as a shield, not allowing black's king to infiltrate. And now you're able to shoulder black's king off of the board and win the f6 pawn and win the game. This is a very important type of breakthrough and it's very easy to identify, right? When you have these types of doubled pawns, and your opponent has one pawn that's stopping them, you always need to think about sacrificing one of your doubled pawns in order to alter the structure in this way. Uh, next, we have what I call the corner kick. This is a very similar type of breakthrough to East Coast, Best Coast, because you sacrifice a set of pawns in order to create a passer. But what distinguishes East Coast, Best Coast from the corner kick breakthrough is that in the corner kick breakthrough, the opposing side does not have doubled pawns, right? That's just... Uh, something I've done for, for convenience, so you can keep these separate in your mind. And uh, the way you do this is you go f6. Now, obviously, you can just take on f6 and create a pass pawn that way. But if you're trying to create an outside passer, what you do is you sack another pawn. This is the easy breakthrough. And after h takes g6, you play the move. Uh, you play the move h6, and you have uh, here a corner pass pawn. So the corner kick, named after the pawn that ultimately does the promoting, right? Boom, boom. You could also get guess called this a free kick. Um, but in any case, black takes both of your pawns and the H pawn promotes and makes a queen. Now, uh, one other breakthrough that is relatively elementary. I was meaning to show this earlier, but again, I, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I just want to get through all of these so you can kind of um, keep them straight in your mind. And, and I didn't tell everybody, but you know, I would be writing these down if I were you just maybe... Uh, taking some notes and trying to associate them in your mind, you know, trying to make sure that you're internalizing them, that's going to help you in the practicum. And this one is uh, a form of the easy breakthrough. You basically set up an easy breakthrough, but this is a very important one, right? So you go h4, and then, of course, again, you can go g5 and create a pass g pawn. But let's say you want a uh, corner pawn. What you do is you go h5 and you stop black's h6 pawn, freeze it in place, and then you go g5. And this is often effective because the move g5 allows black to play h5. And once again, you don't have a corner passer. This can be important if black's king is in the vicinity and can catch the pawn. We'll see this in action in one of the games. So you play h5, then you play g5, uh, forcing the pawn out of the way, and then you play h6. So what you'll see is that a lot of these essentially boil down to the easy breakthrough, but there's a preliminary segment where you have to uh, either sack a pawn or change the pawn structure in some way to allow a basic breakthrough to happen. And finally, we have a square clearer, which is another type of breakthrough that usually doesn't isn't done to create a pass pawn, although it also can. And the abstract breakthrough that I'm showing you does incidentally create a pass pawn, but that's not the point of it. So we have a position like this, right? Where if it's white to move, white may seem to be in Zugzwang. And I'll talk about that in a separate video, but a situation where every move harms your position in some way, right? You have to move your king back, and then black's king advances forward. And the pawn on c6 and the king seem to form this sort of impenetrable force field, which don't allow white to do anything. But this, the, the uh, square clear uh, results after d5 check here. So you sacrifice the pawn. What square are you clearing? You're clearing the square formerly occupied by the pawn onto which the king now steps. You go king d4. And in this specific position, it's still a draw because white isn't able to win this resulting endgame. But again, that's not the point. The point is that this particular type of breakthrough often puts the opposing side either in Zugzwang or We'll see another scenario where if you clear a particular square for your king, you're basically just able to win the game straight away. So we actually examine two different breakthroughs uh, which aren't necessarily performed in order to create a pass pawn, right? The square clear and then the pawn on doubler. So let me just make sure 
uh, that we have all these breakthroughs internalized. I'll go through them one more time really, really quickly just to name them uh, so you can write them down in your notes. Uh, so we had, of course, the bathtub formation. We had the, oh, and one more. I forgot to, uh, I forgot to show this one, which is the dynamite uh, breakthrough. And the ironic thing about this, this is my gripe with the way that uh, pawn breakthroughs are taught. I see this position in almost every lecture, every video on pawn breakthroughs, and this is generally all that people show. And this is a very rare type of breakthrough, but I, sh I show this because it's it's so commonly uh, commonly shown. And uh, I think the reason that people are so attracted to it is because it's really pretty, and it shows the concept that a symmetrical pawn structure does not mean that you can't create a pass pawn. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with it, and the way it goes is like this. You have a three facing a three right here. White strikes in the center with the move g6. And whichever way black takes, white pushes the adjacent pawn to create a passer. So if black takes with the h pawn, then you push the pawn that's to the left of it. You play f6, forcing the g pawn out of the way, and then you play h6. If black takes with the uh, left pawn, then you push the right pawn. You push the uh, pawn that's on the opposing side, which makes sense, right? I mean, the f6 doesn't make any sense because black still has the h pawn. So you play h6, black has to take, and then you play f6, and you advance this pawn to promotion. Now, to date, I never had this particular type of breakthrough in one of my games. Uh, and the way it is often stopped, right, is with the opposing side playing a move like g6 and preventing the breakthrough from happening, but not f6, because here you can play h6, a very common type of blunder, dislodging the g-pawn and creating a far advanced passer. My brother, who's 2100, he actually fell for this many years ago, and I remember he called me and you know, he was obviously embarrassed because he knew this breakthrough but forgot about it. Uh, but other than that, I've really never experienced it. Nonetheless, it's uh, it's very famous, and I, I wanted to show it for, for the sake of completeness. Uh, but as you can see, there are all these other types of breakthroughs, which are, in my opinion, far more common and far more important to understand. So we have the bats up formation. We now have the dynamite. We have the pawn square. Uh, this is the head chopper. Then we had the East Coast best because this is a particularly important one. The easy breakthrough is what we started with. That's where you just break through and sacrifice a pawn. We had the pawn undoubler where you go uh, F6 basically and undouble your pawns. We had the corner kick. We had the square clear. And uh, I think, uh, and we had the stop and go. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, just making sure I'm counting right, nine and 10. Excellent. So I counted correctly. There we go. And now we get to the practicum. And I see that only 17 minutes have passed, so we're moving right along. We can now spend a good quality time on applying these breakthroughs. Okay. And of course, feel free to watch this segment several times. And one thing that you can also do if you had any recent pawn end games, you can now go through them and see if you can identify already any breakthroughs that may have been missed, or maybe you found them, you can now categorize them. And I think that's an instructive process overall. Now we get to the fun part. We get to the application. And for all of the games that I'm about to show, what I recommend you do, uh, as usual, is you pause the video when I first display the position, and you take your time, you try to solve it. You can assume that the, the side to move is the side that we are facing. In this case, it is white to play. And I've chosen deliberately examples that are not very famous, examples often from games between, you know, 18, 1900s players, good players. Uh, but that is a level at which pawn breakthroughs are very frequently overlooked. Now, this is a pretty direct application of the bathtub formation. What you will see if you become an expert in pawn breakthroughs is that you will automatically learn to filter out the stimuli that are not important, to filter out the rest of the pawn structure, right? You rarely have only the pawns that are responsible for the breakthrough. And what you need to do is you need to pick out the, the sort of uh, the, the hazelnut at the center of the Ferrero Rocher candy. I have no idea where that analogy came from. I think my, my English teacher actually made that analogy about something. Uh, and in this case, of course, you should identify the bathtub formation and white wins the game in exactly the way that we discussed. Black's king is far away and it's blocked in by its own pawns. White starts with the move f5 uh, and the game is essentially over. Black tries to ignore it, plays b5 and white plays f6, shoving this pawn down the board. And after the trade, uh, Ereza tried to get uh, his king as close as possible. White has no time to waste. King e5 is a threat and the sort of automatic king d4 would actually lose the game uh, to the move e5 check followed by king e6. So you don't you don't want to waste time. You want to go g5. And uh, there's a, a little cool part about this, which is that, okay, if black takes hg, then white goes h6. There's not much to calculate in this pawn race. Uh, it's not a very fair one. 
But black did something kind of clever. He went king e5 in this position. And after gh6, he went king f6. And it actually looks like black's king has successfully dealt with the pawns, which is a common outcome of pawn breakthroughs. You shouldn't expect that you promote every single time. But if you look at this carefully, you will see that black is in Zugzwang. Any king move allows the pawns to promote. So all that white has to do is just wait it out, right? You got to just wait out the rest of black's pawn moves. And white played king d4. Black resigned. Black's only pawn move is b4. You know, a4 is similar. You just take it and go a3. Black has one more pawn move. You take d5 and the game is over. Black has nothing better than to give away the e-pawn. And then finally, he's going to have to move his king. So that's a, a very important type of position where one of your pass pawns is blocking. Uh, both pass pawns are in a very elegant fashion blocking the king from stopping them. That's why doubled pawns are so underrated in chess and shouldn't be scoffed at. The one other thing that I'll point out after f5, more resilient would have been to take on f5 because here you obviously don't want to rush with e6. Uh, because black takes and stops the pawn. But this is where, you know, knowledge that you acquire in all of the videos kind of stacks on top of each other. Hopefully, the previous videos should have helped you uh, figure out a good way to win this position. But th the awesome part is that after b5, the most effective win is to use another breakthrough, the square clearer. And it is via a square clearer that white puts black in Zugzwang. So once again, pause the video, see if you can find a square clearer to win the game. Not the only win, but... Uh, the most effective one. And I'll take a, a sip of water in the meantime. So the win is yielded with the move b4 check. A takes before king b3, a square clear, and a breakthrough that doesn't uh, involve creating another pass pawn. This puts black in Zugzwang. Black can't push any of his pawns. Black has no choice but to move his king back. And then after king takes before king b6, you use another concept that you acquired, the notion of creating an outside pass pawn, the classical plan. So you create a decoy pass pawn, you use this decoy pass pawn to draw the king away, then you take b5, and the rest is easy. You just push this a pawn, uh, you win the d pawn, and the game is the game is over king d7, king c5, and black has to choose between giving away this pawn, then you get trousers, or stopping this pawn and allowing the a pawn to promote. So a bathtub formation here resulting in a pass pawn. And there could have been a space clear if Black had defended more resiliently. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, this is another game that's not particularly famous. Two players in the 2000 rating range. And this one is uh, really, really tragic. I'm sure uh, Calderon Zuluaga has not forgotten this game because White is winning in the initial position. The way that White wins this is incredibly instructive in its own right, which is why I chose this position particularly. Like it could have given you a million examples of this breakthrough. First, let's take a look at what actually happened. So White uh, plays the unassuming move. A3 looks like a pretty normal move. White's just pushing a pawn. Black responds by closing the pawn structure with A4. Okay, now what White should have done here is gone before and push this pawn through. But instead, Calderon goes king e3. And I think his logic is that he thinks that black is in Zugzwang, right? And he thinks, okay, black has to take b3, and then I'm gonna create an outside passer and I'm going to win. But uh, those with a keen eye for breakthroughs will recognize the error of his ways and they will recognize why black played a4. The reason black played a4 is to establish a pawn square and after b4, white is losing. And the hilarious thing is that in playing king e3, white actually went away from the queen side, which means that this a pawn is now going to be unstoppable. And after a takes b3, a3, a takes b4, a3, black made a new queen. White made a couple, a couple more moves, but resigned very quickly because this pawn is unstoppable. This is a serious player who missed a pawn square and even a lot of grandmasters have overlooked this concept as well. Now let's get back to the starting position and talk about what white should have done. Now, what you will notice if you've sort of mastered the previous videos is that the h4 pawn is very annoying. It's deep freezing two of white's pawns. But that doesn't mean you can't circumvent the deep freeze and you can circumvent the deep freeze by bringing your king to f2, right? A breakthrough with g3 would be foolish because it would give black a very far advanced passer, but you can get your king to f2 and then push g3 to uh, get out of the deep freeze and create an outside passer. And the best way to do this is to start with the move c3. The point is to stop Black's king from advancing to d4. That's like when they would bury vampires, right? You'd put spikes on the grave, right? You're not allowing that king to rise up from the dead. Black's king has nothing better to do than to just move back and forth. And the problem is that if Black ever goes b4, you just go c4, getting a connect uh, protected pass pawn and winning the game immediately. So Black has nothing better to do than to just sit around and wait. Now you go king f2. Now, here's the really cool part. If black continues to wait, then it's obvious. You go g3, 
And hopefully you can see that trousers are inevitable. You're going to push the H pawn and at the right moment, you're also going to push the C pawn and create a second passer. Black can only create one passer that is easily restrained by White's king. Okay, so uh, the question, of course, is, well, what happens if black doesn't cooperate and black plays f4? But f4 creates a gaping hole on e4. That's very important. It also prevents black hamstrings black uh, from creating a pass pawn of his own. So now you go back with your king. You go king e2. If black waits, then you go king d3. And hopefully you know the drill. You create a passer, again, using it as a decoy. Then you go king e4 and you mop up all of black's uh, you know, crippled kingside pawns, which can now no longer defend themselves. Black can try the move e4 here, but now you trade and you do exactly the same thing. c4 is not as effective because black takes and goes king d4. Instead, you want to go a4, a very important concept, because a lot of people think, oh, if I'm creating a pass pawn, I want it to be as far advanced as possible. But as we discussed in uh, the video on pawn races, that's not always true. Uh, sometimes you want the pawn to be as far away from the enemy king, right? Because you're using this pawn as a decoy. You're not trying to promote it. And to use it as a decoy, you want the distance between that pawn and the enemy king to be as high as possible. So the best move is to play a4. That pawn stays on c3. Black has to waste additional time going king d5. And black is just in Zugzong. Now you go king d3. And you can simply promote, uh, you can simply promote this pawn. Actually, the move king f3 also wins. Um, it also wins. You can take f4 and then go g4. And the pawn race is, uh, wait a minute, no, the pawn race is actually not easily winning because by applying rule one of pawn race is not taking unnecessary pawns, black goes king b3 and you get a queen endgame where white's still winning. Uh, so in fact, uh, white should play king d3 and then c4. That's, uh, that's the bottom line here. And uh, a pawn square, never too late to save the game. Next, we have a, an example from Grandmaster practice. Two Grandmasters, two British Grandmasters facing off against each other. And in this rook endgame, white played the, the unassuming move king d2. Black thought about it and said, okay, I've got a pawn majority on the queen set, and like the good endgame master that I am, I know that I can win by forcing a rook trade, then using my pawn majority to create a decoy, and winning white's kingside pawns. What could be wrong with that logic? Watson played rook c4. Pause the video and see if you can figure out whether there was a fly in the ointment. Okay, well, if I'm asking the question, uh, hopefully you were able to figure out that there, in fact, is. And white, in fact, should trade rooks. And uh, those of you with a keen tactical eye will recognize the corner kick formation, right? It's a slightly different type of pawn structure, but the, the bottom line is exactly the same. You play the move f5. This is what Watson had overlooked. He took on f5. Here's another breakthrough. It's incredibly important not to go h5 first. Again, don't procrastinate and always understand where your opponent's king is and try to figure out how urgently you need to act. In this case, you need to act very urgently. h5. And Watson resigned after king d5, g6. The funny thing is white doesn't even need to play the move h6. White can just take on g6 and then promote straight away. And uh, a very strong grandmaster simply overlooked this. Now, one other important line is king d5, which would have actually been more resilient. What does white do here? Well, here we have another breakthrough, which I showed in the sort of theoretical segment. E6, f takes c6. And now what do you do? Now a very, very important moment. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out. This is just as crucial as the initial position. So here you should identify that you have an easy breakthrough that wins the game on the spot. I think a lot of people would be tempted to play f6, but after king d6, the pawn st the king stops the pawn, and this is actually a draw. Black threatens to create trousers, so white can deep freeze black's pawns. But in this position, there is simply no way to make progress. And you can convince yourself of this by setting this up on a board and moving your pieces around, but this is actually a draw. But it's all a moot point, because if you allow yourself to consider other options, you'll see f takes g6, h g6, h5, and I love this, the fact that the e6 pawn is actually blocking black's king from stopping white's pawns, g h5, g6, and the game is over. Um, king e6 is impossible, it's illegal. And this is one of the most elegant things about pawn breakthroughs, the fact that they often leave your opponent's pawns on squares where they're obstructing the king. That's not a coincidence, that happens pretty frequently, and that's something that you should factor in to your thinking. So... In this way, Levitt was able to swindle a very bad rook endgame. Had black simply played rook h3, black has excellent winning chances. 
Watson uh, never lived that down and retired from chess after this game. Fun story. No, just kidding. He didn't retire from chess, but uh, I'm sure he didn't forget this one for a while. And another one that uh, will not be forgotten for a while is the game between Weinstein and Michael Rode, who is now a very strong grandmaster and a lawyer. Uh, but in this game, tragedy struck for Rode. Um, he did not take the right road. Okay, that was that was low hanging fruit. I had to do it. I greatly apologize. I understand that you might unsubscribe. You will be forgiven if you do so. So it's black to play here. Let's flip the board. It's black to play in this position. And as with the previous example, you would be forgiven for thinking that white is totally winning because white has the stock plan, right? Pass pawn, get the king over, win black's pawns. But hopefully by now you've realized that you can't think like that. You have to look at the actual pawn structure and you can't be fooled into thinking that just because it doesn't look like you can't create a passer means you can't create a passer. And if you've paid attention during the theoretical segment, you will see that this is almost an exact application of East Coast, Best Coast. Okay, let's go back to East Coast, Best Coast. Just a moment. Let me find it. No, this is the, uh, this is the corner kick. So this is the very similar one. This is East Coast, Best Coast. And essentially what we do is we ultimately need to get rid. What do we need to get rid of? Well, we need to get rid of one pawn, and then we need to get rid of the other pawn. So we, in this case, just push f5 and then push h5, h6. Back we go to the uh, road game. Um, in this position, okay, let's flip the board again. Black starts by playing f4. And that should be pretty obvious, although that's not what road played. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, now if white doesn't trade... Now it's a direct application. You play f3, and after g takes f3, you don't automatically take f3. Stealing a rule from the pawn raise chapter, um, don't take unnecessary pawns, right? And you can't make any assumptions in pawn endgames about what needs to be done. You don't need to recapture stuff that wastes time. You just go h4. You've done the hard work. Now you do the easy work of creating a passer. And again, we have a scenario in which white's pawns actually block the king from stopping black's passer. White uh, loses in that line. So after f4, and I think this is the reason why Rode didn't play this white plays g takes f4. You play g takes f4. Notice, some of you might be tempted by g4, but here white can deep freeze the pawns by playing g3. So you actually do recapture here. And after king d4, it's easy to stop calculating and say, that's it, I'm losing all of my pawns. And yet, now we take a page out of the corner kick. And it turns out that we can get rid of that g pawn, not by playing f3 immediately, because here white can sink the entire battleship with g3, but by first playing e3, forcing this pawn out of the way, creating a temporary pass pawn, forcing this pawn out of the way, and after h4, yet another scenario in which the pawns are blocking white's king from preventing the h pawn from promoting. What an amazing breakthrough. This would have won Road the game. And instead, what did he do? And I think he just lost hope. And rather than playing f4, he played h4. Is this symmetrical? Is this the same thing? No, because after GH, GH, the opportunity train has left the station. White goes king d4, and you can't go f4 anymore. You lose e4, and you're just not in time to go f3. The king takes the pawn. And so Rode had nothing better to do than to go king e6, and now white wins with the conventional method. Trade, king d6, a6. The game is over. King c6, king e5, and white took all the pawns. And I, I really wonder if, if uh, Weinstein realized that black had this during the game. It would be pretty crazy if they came back to their hotel rooms and then Rode realized that uh, computers didn't exist. Of course, at the time, this was the 1970s. Uh, maybe I'll actually send Michael Rode a message not to remind him of, you know, of, of painful memories. But nonetheless, uh, this, would be, <laughs> this would be an interesting thing to pull him on. The move F4. Again, you have the East Coast, Best Coast, which is tightly related to the corner kick. The bottom line is that you get rid of both of these pawns and you create a passed H. Pawn, you can see the other theme uh, by which pawns are actually obstructing the king, stopping it from, from stopping the pawn. Oop. So this one, I should have rewinded to the start, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, it's a bit of a giveaway, but that's fine. Uh, this is a very instructive one, right? Another game between two 2100s. And uh, let's start in this position because I think it's instructive the way that the, the game unrolls and leads up to the pawn breakthrough. So in this position, black makes a very ingenious move, a very ingenious move. Goldberg plays queen c4, and he basically says, okay, I'm fine getting into a pawn end game, but I'm doing it on my terms. And white decided to trade, which is a mistake, actually. Why is it a mistake? Because Goldberg takes with the d pawn. So far, this is all correct. And he correctly identified a potential pass pawn that can be created on the queen side. So yet again, you might have a situation where black creates a decoy passer on 
V uh, queen side. But you would also be correct in identifying a bat sub formation. Okay, so you have a bat sub formation. And where is that? What does that lead to? So can you play like f5 here, right? Well, not really, because first of all, white's already played g4, g5, right? In the bat sub formation, we want to play f5, f6. And this is a suboptimal way of creating a passer. g6 is out of the question. It gives black a protected outside passer, and the king is way too close for any pawn breakthroughs. Uh, to be to be effective, let me just uh, give you a moment here. Charge my keyboard a little bit. Okay. In the meantime, start thinking about what uh, can be done instead. Okay. Okay. There we go. So uh, basically, after Queen C4 D C, White has nothing better to do than to approach the king, approach the center with his king. Goes king f3, and here black makes an incredibly instructive mistake. Goldberg probably quickly played king d7. Totally reasonable, right? King e4, king c6. You get the king into the center. That's what you're taught. And yet this fails to a breakthrough. And what he should have done is played a5 as quickly as possible, creating a pass pawn on the queen side. We'll get to that. First, let's figure out what the heck is wrong with this move. Pause the video, see if you can figure out which breakthrough applies here. And there's a bit of a red herring. I deliberately implanted the bat sub formation in your mind to make you not realize that there's another breakthrough. I'm evil like that. But hopefully you were not fooled. And hopefully you can see that the conditions are optimal for a square clearer. You go d5 check, and then you go king d4. And once again, black is not only in Zugzwang, but the square clear in this case also benefits the king side pawn formation because now you are ready to create a passer now you are ready to exploit the bat sub formation by playing f5 you've gotten rid of the e6 pawn and so you've circumvented the drawback of the move g5 and black resigned here because after hgf6 gf you play h6 and you win the game the pawn promotes to a queen e takes f6 by the way is actually really really bad another great example of where you shouldn't automatically recapture pawns it might seem like this pawn race is laughably decided. White stops the pawn, but trousers. Here comes the other pawn with check. And amazingly, black is better after h7, d2, uh, king e2, g2. Black promotes at the same time as white. And black promotes with a check by sacking one of the pawns and promoting the other one. A typical idea. Black is better in the end game. So you have to go h6 here. But black resigned after f5, realizing that f6 is unstoppable. And black wasn't able to create anything on the queen side. So instead of going king d7, Black should have played a5. Now you might, well, how would that have helped? After king e4, black plays b4. And there's the rub. A takes b4, a takes b4. And if white tries to do the same exact thing, then black takes on d5. And you might say, well, this is the same thing. But clearly it's not because black's king is now a lot better position. Black simply goes up to e6 and there is nothing that white can do. White can't even move past d4 with this king because of the possibility of an unstoppable pass pawn being created. So... Uh, just a really, really instructive, right? A5 creates the preconditions for a pass pawn. It keeps the king as close to the site of the breakthrough as possible. Instead, black kind of automatically brought the king up to c6, allowing the square clear, which not only clears the square for the king, but also creates a pass pawn. So as you can see, some of these breakthroughs are in a gray area, right? You can have one type of breakthrough, but it could be done for a different reason. Uh, this is the stop and grow bre breakthrough that we already talked about. Um, it's just that my examples were a little out of order. This is another instructive game. This is a pretty simple one, uh, a game between a 2100 and a 1600. It is white to play. Uh, what should white do in this position? Pause the video, try to figure it out. So hopefully you were able to see that a stop and go scenario is on the card. So what you do here is you go H4. Now, here's the interesting thing. Black could have prevented the breakthrough by moving his king to e6 and meeting h5 uh, with the move f6. But here's what black did instead. And this is as instructive as the breakthrough itself. Black pushed the a pawn. And this is a very, very common mistake at all levels, really. And black is a very capable player. Just sort of pushing pawns without really realizing why is a big no-no. And there will be another video spe specifically dedicated, specifically dedicated to waiting moves 
which essentially says that you shouldn't push pawns, you shouldn't give up waiting moves unless you need to, because you want to keep your waiting moves in reserve. They could be they could be of tremendous importance in causing Zugzwang. So if we go back for a second to the position after King e6, if white were to play h5, black actually wins with the move King f6. Now you might say, what are you talking about? I have a square clear and black is in Zugzwang, he's got to move his king. Well, no, he doesn't, because some genius decided to leave... Uh, leave himself with uh, a series of waiting moves. Black plays a5, and it is actually white who has to move the square clear, who has been a disaster. White has to move the king back, and he loses the game because black has connected passers. So after king f6, black already wins, and white should just move the king back, and this is a draw. This is a total standoff. Neither side can do anything. But because black played a5, now white plays h5, and black is now actually in Zugzwang. By Daos played a4, but now it's time for the square clear. G5 check, king G4, and king takes G5 is coming. And of course, uh, the game is easily won because white has the outside passer. In the game, black did not take the pawn, went king G7, but white takes king F5. And uh, the rest is very easy. H6 check and king F6, the classical plan, and white wins the pawn. So another combination of two different breakthroughs, identifying the stop and go breakthrough, but then realizing that uh, you have the square clear, but also instructive from the point of view that it shows that you shouldn't just push random pawns. You should usually try to keep your extra pawn moves in reserve in case you get a situation where you have a standoff uh, and both sides are exhausting their pawn moves. Down to the last two examples, we're moving at a good pace here. And this is really one of my favorite ones because it it really is such a direct application of uh, of a pawn breakthrough that's just not often talked about. Now, it's white to play in this position. This comes from a blitz game that I played against Yu Yangi, very strong grandmaster, a couple of years ago, and it's white to move. Clearly, I'm trying to win. I'm up a pawn, uh, but, but can white actually make progress in this position? So once again, pause the video, see if you can figure something out. So hopefully you're able to see that white has the potential to trade queens with queen f4 check. And because white is up a pawn, you might say that it's, well, it's easily winning. But I didn't do this. And the reason I didn't do it is because I figured that with my pawn structure as hamstrung as it is, I would not be able to make progress. And again, this was a blitz game. I was really low on time. But if you listen carefully during the theoretical segment, you will see that the preconditions are optimal for what kind of breakthrough? A pawn on doubler. So before undoubling your pawns, it's worthwhile to bring your king up to e4. You get exactly the kind of scenario we talked about. And now the only way to win is to play f5 check. This is also a type of square clear, but the main purpose of it is to undouble your pawns and create a scenario after f3, waiting move, Zugzwang, black has to move the king to the side and whichever way he goes, white goes the other way, a classic scenario, and white wins the game. White wins f5 and the rest is... Uh, an easy theoretical win. And actually, after f4, you can take on f4, but even more effective is to ignore that pawn and shoulder black's king all the way back to take h5 and then take f4. That's even easier. So had I understood, had I identified the pawn structure here, I would have probably seen this in a couple of seconds. But I didn't bother to think about it. I just looked at the fact that the pawns were doubled and I thought, well, there's no way to win. Because I thought, in this position, you just have to dilly-dally with your king. There's no way to make progress. And yet there is. You break through, not to create a pass pawn, but in order to shoulder Black's king into oblivion. And finally, we have a game of Gary Kasparov. I think it's always fitting to end with a, uh, with, with, with a Kasparov game. And this is yet another example of a square clearer. And the reason I've had a lot of these examples is because I think it's so easy to forget about these types of breakthroughs and uh, and just sort of forget that they exist. So in this position, it's white to play. We have a similar question as in the previous example. Should white trade queens or not? What do you think Kasparov chose? So if you think that trading queens is bad because, well, because it just seems like White is no way to make progress, and Black is actually better due to his king position, I would forgive you, right? That's a tempting assumption to make. But look very carefully at the pawns and see if you can figure out whether there might be a breakthrough. Hopefully, you're able to see that White has in store the possibility of pushing his pawn to d5 when the moment is right. King d3, king f4, and the square clear with d5. After cd5, White's king steps up to d4, takes d5, travels around, and takes Black's pawns. 
Now, the amazing thing, and again, I'm deliberately including these examples where it's not just about the breakthrough. I'm trying to get you to think about other concepts as well. This will be a nice way to preface our later videos, which just examine complex endgames. Black can actually still draw. And Nikolic, he lost his cool here. He, he, he lost hope, and he just went for the automatic king f5. Then he played king f6, and he resigned after king d6. This is a GM we're speaking about, right? So this shows us how... Uh, tempting it can be to fall into illusions, and the king gets to c7. But in this position, black, and even after king f5, black can draw, but the cleanest draw is to play king f3 and essentially approach the white king from behind. This is such an important motif, right? Very often in your brain, you think, well, I have to go all the way around to my pawns, but that's not the fastest route. And in this case, the fastest route is to go from behind. If white goes king d6, you go king d4. Now, of course, white can play c6, and clearly white wins the a-pawn, but hopefully you're able to calculate that after king d4, king b6, king steps up to d5 and reaches the promised land just in time. It reaches c6, and black is able to make the draw. But this uh, doesn't render the actual breakthrough any less instructive, and at one Kaspar of the game, without it, white is actually, you know, struggling to make a draw. Uh, so the move d5 is white's only chance. And of course, if black had not taken the pawn, white pushes d6 and creates a protected passer, uh, winning the game pretty straight forwardly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the practicum. I think 45 minutes is a really good amount of time. It's a little faster than I anticipated, which is good. And I know I went pretty quickly through all of these breakthroughs, but hopefully you were able to take all of them down. So we discussed 10 of the most common types of pawn breakthroughs. We examined a bunch of real game scenarios where a lot of these breakthroughs are applied. And again, are the, is this a comprehensive examination of pawn breakthroughs? Am I uh, catching every single type of common pawn breakthrough? Absolutely not. But again, I'm just trying to get you to identify the most common ones. And hopefully I was able to instill in you an appreciation for the fact that pawn structure, understanding the pawn structure very keenly, right? Understanding where the breakthrough could happen can actually save you a loss position and it can allow you to convert an end game. Advantage king position is also incredibly important. So in addition to the breakthroughs themselves, we also discussed waiting moves. We discussed how king position can impact breakthroughs in particular. We saw a lot of examples where your opponent's pawns are actually preventing the king from stopping the pass pawn that is created via a breakthrough. And that was a whirlwind tour of pawn breakthroughs. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, as usual, I just want to thank everyone, everybody for the incredibly wholesome feedback on the first few on-game videos. It means so much to me and it motivates me to keep creating these videos. So by all means, send through your constructive criticism. Uh, whatever questions you have, and I'll try to get to them. But for now, I await you in the next video, and thank you so much for watching. Go uh, create some pawns via some breakthroughs. Goodbye, and see you soon.